This week, it's all about work camping or working from the road. How to make a living from anywhere to make full-time or extended RV life possible. We talk about all the options out there and we interview Carrie DePhillips, co-host of the Workationing Podcast, who started a business with $500 and now travels the world, managing her company and several employees entirely over the internet. This is RV Miles. RV Miles is sponsored by L.L. Bean. L.L. Bean is a proud partner of the National Park Foundation, and you can help them support the parks by shopping their limited edition National Park Collection. Every time you purchase products from the National Park Collection, which includes totes, shirts, hats, patches, and more, you're helping to protect, restore, and improve parks throughout the U.S. Search National Park Collection at llbean.com and be an outsider with L.L. Bean. Welcome to episode 145 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two full-time travelers who, along with our boys, Jack, Ethan, and Henry, are crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip. Each week, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from travel destinations to gear, industry news, our national parks, and a whole lot more. We are... Uh... We are enjoying we are the sun. We are here enjoying We are here again the in the same spot we've been for <laughs> nine weeks. Yeah, don't even need to go into it. <laughs> it's going to be another warm day, though, here in the Sedona area. It, it has been very warm lately, and uh, we get, did get a little bit of respite, a few days of 80-some degree weather, and now we're back up in the 90s we every are. day. Again, it is quite toasty, but... We'll take it over uh, being cold. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're trying to fit this podcast in before the 20 mile per hour winds show up today. Every, here day, the in this, every day in this valley here, the winds start to ramp up around 10 o'clock or so. As and they, they are right now. they <laughs> stay up all day long yes. until like 6 or 7 yes. o'clock and they ramp down. You can actually see the chart. If you go to... Um, we, I use the Weather Channel app, but there are other apps that show wind speeds. But if you go into the w Weather Channel app, they actually show a graph that shows you what the wind is going to be like for the day. And, and if you're <laughs> watching this on YouTube, then you are seeing right now that when we started this intro, there was nothing going on. And by the time we ended the intro, the wind is picking up enough that I don't know how long the awning is going to survive well, out here. The, 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 we'll see. <laughs> this the, might. We're gonna have to speed through this. <laughs> <laughs> Wind's not really blowing into the mics very much. So not too it's much. Not, not the worst not thing in the world. Too much. Hey, we're having a good time here, though. We're getting stuff done around the rig. We're, you know, sort of preparing for the idea that uh, eventually we might leave here. Eventually. And, and trying to get stuff uh, done that we've been wanting to get done that we've been putting off for all this time. If you've been following us for a while, you know, earlier this year I installed uh, a bed lift kit under our, our bed in, the, in the, the master bedroom. The suite, the, <laughs> the master suite. So what it is is two pneumatic rods that that raise the bed up because our, our bed, you had to lift it up on your own and hold it up. But since we put in our Wilderness RV mattress, which is awesome, but very heavy, uh, it's very difficult to lift our bed up and get the stuff under it. And we have most of our clothes underneath it. So I had to, you know, lift the bed up while Abby would go under and I'd hold it. And then, then she'd hold it while I got stuff on my it side. It was quite the circus. <laughs> so I put these, I put this bed lift kit in. And unfortunately what happened is the lifts were too strong. So they blew out the whole front face of our bed. And we have been going uh, with that like that for months now. Yeah, and um, it's a real workout <laughs> because it's only it's built by out of one by two wood. It's real small wood for a bed. Anyway, they did not ever anticipate <laughs> you wanting to put a better mattress on that mattress that, or on the bed that they had provided. So yesterday I went out and uh, and got some angle brackets and sort of rebuilt the front end of our 
our bed and now we have our lift kit back working and it is oh, awesome it's glorious <laughs> it's it is so, so nice it's so great to have i'm also going to finally get our cub blind spot detection system installed which uh, yes which i've been procrastinating on because we haven't been driving anywhere but yeah. i want to get it installed before we drive somewhere again for sure we should also mention that we have a video on youtube because you just reinstalled or put in for the third time since we've owned this trailer a new vent cover for the oven the exhaust the, yeah the 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 range I'm looking hood at it now. <laughs> the, the range hood <laughs> vent the so the fan that goes over your stove uh the the vent that vents to the exterior has blown off our rig twice uh, now, and uh, once within the first month of ownership. And it was sort of like a two-part system, so the outer part came off, and it was just hold on, held on by two little tabs, and I, it was stupid. So now, <laughs> now I've replaced it with like this twelve-dollar vent cover from uh, from Amazon that is all one piece, so it can't blow off. So we've been getting a lot of stuff done around here, and that includes uh, personal maintenance as well. We we all got haircuts. We did. Uh, <laughs> courtesy of our, our I, I cut everyone's hair, but courtesy of our neighbors who let us borrow their dog hair trimmer. <laughs> That's what it took to get I, it done. <laughs> I cut I cut the three boys with the dog trimmer. Yes. And myself, <laughs> and Abby got Abby got a little scissor cut. Uh, yeah, I got a couple <laughs> inches on the ends, but we have been trying to find uh, a hair cutting system for weeks now. We can't get one online. We can't get one at any of the stores here. And those kids were in desperate need of a haircut. Yeah, so were you. Heat. We all were. Yeah. And there is so hot. So Jason just buzzed them right off. So everyone came to Jason's hair salon <laughs> and we got it done. <laughs> it, it was it was quite interesting. But it, it I've, cut, I've cut the kids hair on the road before, but never with dog dog grooming clippers. Those they're, good. they're fantastic clippers. Those the only really thing is good. like the combs on them are very long. <laughs> well, so it's not... like to work the little peanut head of Henry <laughs> was was a challenge. So they uh, all look it, very, very it, cute. It was interesting. But uh, speaking of, re of repairs, we talked to some friends of ours who have recently got a repair on the road. And uh, that's one of the things that is also changing during these times of coronavirus uh, is, is actually getting maintenance and repair. So they gave us some interesting feedback of how that process went for them. Yeah, so what she said was that their rig was going to a dealership in Georgia and that the dealership wasn't going to go into their rig for five days because that is the new state procedure. So what they do is they have to wait five days for the rig to be empty and then they go in and they disinfect before they start any work. So they're trying to let the virus die off if it's living on surfaces right. over five days. And then they're going to go in and disinfect it. Wow. And then they'll go in and they'll start the work. So this is in the state of Georgia. I'm guessing that it is different state by state. Well, I'm sure different dealerships have different policies yeah. of how they're trying to keep their employees safe as well. Yeah. So this was some work they were having done on a Grand Design fifth wheel. And their dealership shared this information with them, which I thought was really interesting. And we thought they gave us permission to share it here on the show. Excellent. All right, well, this week we're continuing our full-time series where we're talking about all the different things that you need to know if you want to be a new full-time RVer. But it's not just for full-timers either. It's for people that want to just extend their RV trips and just be able to refresher. be on the, on the road longer. So this week we're talking about work camping. And work camping can mean any type of work from the road, really. Some people use it to just mean working at a campground, but really work camping can mean running your own business. It can mean uh, it can mean anything. Really, it means working while you're camping. And uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different ways that you can make money while you're traveling. And we have a great interview. So we're going to take a break and we're going to come back. We'll have the answer to last week's brain teaser. And then we're going to talk about working from the road. Be right back. The RV Miles podcast is supported by Harvest Hosts. Get back on the road again safely with a Harvest Hosts membership. Enjoy wide open RV camping on over a thousand wineries, farms, breweries, museums, and other unique attractions that invite RVers to visit and stay overnight for free. 
Plus, you're supporting local businesses who need help right now. RV Miles listeners can save 15% off a Harvest Host membership with code MILES. That's M-I-L-E-S for 15% off your Harvest Hosts membership. We will link to it in the show notes at rvmiles.com slash 145. It's time for the answer to last week's brain teaser, which went like this. Which tree comes next in this list? So there's a list and then there's a, there's a selection that you can choose from to be the next tree. So here's the list. Oak, gum, maple, pine, palm, fir, cedar, holly, plum. And the choices are for the one that comes next, willow, beech, juniper, elm, or sourwood. <laughs> and the answer is elm. Each tree has the same number of letters as numbers 1 to 10 have. So elm, ha- it, the, the number 10 has 10 three letters in it, T-E-N, and elm has three letters, T-E-N. And, and you mean you, E-L-M. I'm sorry. <laughs> E-L-M. <laughs> and if you go back through that list, you know, maple is the third one, and it has M-A-P-L-E is five letters, and three has five letters in it, T-H-R-E-E. So sneaky. All right, it's time to talk work camping. Yes. Work camping can mean so many things. Um, but there are all kinds of ways to make money from the road. And this is really the biggest concern for a lot of people that plan to go full time. They want to go full time. They just can't figure out how to do it, how to earn a living. They might not be retiring. They might need an income to help them survive out on the road. Like us. Yeah. So a lot of people run their own businesses like us. A lot of people work for other employers. Uh, and a lot of people actually don't work on the internet. So those types of people that work on the internet, we call them digital digital nomads are are able to sort of work from anywhere. But then there are all sorts of other jobs that people do that involve them doing work in the physical world and uh, and they go to different locations to do it. And one of the top ways that people do that is is working in campgrounds. Campgrounds are almost always hiring seasonal workers. They uh, often have camp hosts which can either pay money or it's a site for work trade, which is one way, you know, if you don't have a ton of money, but you have savings and you can get out on the road, but you don't want to spend money on campgrounds, that's one way you can do it. You get a free campsite by putting in so many hours of work. Often with those camp hosts, they're not interested in you just being there for a week or two. So this is going to be a long term, even seasonal, maybe from the time the campground opens till the time the campground closes. But they're going to want you for a long period of time. It's easier for them. So if this is something you're interested in, do know that that for a period of time slows your travel down. Yeah. If you're really set on like week after week or every two weeks moving, then this isn't really what you're going to want to look into because they're not going to want to hire you. And all types of campgrounds uh, hire work campers or at least volunteer work campers for a site trade, including federal, state, uh, and and, uh, and private campgrounds. And you do have to be a little careful, though, because some of them want a lot. You know, some yeah. of them want a couple that puts 30 hours each in, so that's 60 hours for just a campsite trade. And you do the math on that and it ends up being like $3 an hour. Yeah, and, and we looked into that once. And when we got sort of the hours they were wanting up against what they were charging for the site, it made absolutely no sense for us to take that many hours away from a business at the time that we were trying to build. So it didn't really make sense for us, but there are a lot of people that it does make sense for. And so again, each one is different. You just have to look into it, be flexible, but know what you want going into it as well. And then there are other businesses that have campgrounds that hire other types of workers. So what am I talking about? Um, first of all, national parks. Uh, if you want to work as a as somebody that works for like a concessionaire in a, in a national park, so Yellowstone has a big campground that is just for people who work at Yellowstone, and you know you can work in the lodges, work in in the food service, and all that sort of stuff, and earn a regular living and 
be in the middle of Yellowstone National Park, which is pretty cool. Not a bad way to earn a living. There are amusement parks that have uh, attached RV parks where they hire seasonal employees to work rides in the amusement parks or to work concessions or whatever in the amusement park, and then you camp on their grounds. Dollywood, for instance, is one that does that. So if you want to hang out in Dollywood, then go over there and check out and see what they're doing. And Amazon is another option mm -hmm. that does a similar thing. Amazon has a thing called Camper Force. And what they do is they have a campground at their distribution center, or they have a relationship with a local campground. And you come and you stay at the at the campground at, and, and you work at Amazon's distribution facilities and sometimes making pretty good money. It's usually seasonal work around the holidays. Usually it's like uh, October through December or January. And, and they're, they're always in need of a lot of employees as sort of that busy holiday season picks up and you can make a lot of money quickly then. Now it's possible they're needing work sooner than that as a lot of the way we shop in this country has drastically changed and moved to online. So again, it's just another option for you to make some money while you're out there. Yeah, and uh, there are also other places like farms that do the same thing. The beet harvest up in North Dakota is something a lot of people do. You go do this beet harvest, which is grueling work. It's like 12 hour days or more, and it's cold, and you're like, you're- <laughs> You're really selling it, You're Jason. working <laughs> really, really hard for a short amount of time though. You know, it's two, three weeks or so, and you're working your butt off but you make a lot of money over a short amount of time. And a lot of people do gigs like that. Kind of cool, the idea that you're working the land. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of opportunities to do that anymore. So if, you know, really getting your hands down into the soil and experiencing what it's like to harvest food interests you, I think that's super cool. And work camping is nothing new. I mean, there no. have been people that have been doing this forever. Circus workers, uh, carnival workers, Oil pipeline workers. There's a lot of oil pipeline workers that travel Traveling all over the place. Traveling medical professionals. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are seeing that a lot right now, actually, as so many people give of their time and their experience and their knowledge as they move about the country to help those suffering from COVID-19. I know somebody that is an oil pipeline, and not, not a worker, he doesn't build pipelines, but it inspects them. So, uh, and, and a lot of people can get these jobs uh, pretty easily and basically travels around and, and walks the length or runs a drone along the length of an oil pipeline and, and finds out if there are leaks and makes sure that everything's up to date and, and, and working properly. Well, when we were in Minot at that campground, mm -hmm. the majority of people that were there staying longer than just to pass through overnight were those who were there doing some sort of seasonal construction work. All these energy companies, the oil companies, uh, they have in the big oil states like Texas and New Mexico, they have uh, oil fields where they have they hire gate guards. And a lot of RVers do this work where they become a gate guard for a few months. And basically, you're a security guard. And um, usually they hire two at, at once and you work 12 hours on and 12 hours off. And all your job is is to check people in and to make sure that people are allowed in when they drive up to the gate. It, it pays very well generally, but it's it's lonely. You're out in the middle of nowhere. You don't get days off and it's very, very, very windy. But um, but it's, a good again, a good way to work for a short amount of time to make some money quickly. And a lot of people do all sorts of different things like this. So in the show notes, we're going to link to some resources that offer uh, all different ideas for different jobs that you could have working from the road. But we really think that if you plan to go full time, this is, this is the thing you got to figure out first. This is the thing you got to take the time to realize, uh, am I making enough money? Am I going to make enough money? Do, can I find a job that will do this? And, and there are all kinds of opportunities, again, in the physical world, but then there are all kinds of online opportunities. And there will be more online opportunities as the world turns, as, as the, especially because companies now are really embracing remote workers due to the coronavirus, um, they're being forced to. So there will be more job opportunities like digital assistants, doing graphic design if you have those types of skills, uh, editing, all sorts of gig work online. There's educational opportunities as well. You know, our kids do something called, uh, they take classes from a place called outschool.com, mm -hmm. 
which is often just individuals who have an extreme knowledge of something, something they specialize in, maybe that is digital editing or whatever, and they offer these classes. They can be one-off classes, they can be classes that are four weeks long, three weeks, two weeks, whatever. They can be in-person, online happening, or flex. You can come in and do them as you like. These are fantastic ways to make an education. You can build off of what you already know through this platform. I do not know what their vetting process is to be an educator at outschool.com. So you would need to go and look for that yourself and do the research. But there are opportunities like that where you can share your knowledge with others and help them learn maybe something that they're really interested in. Now, you know, We've talked a little bit about admin work. There are some websites where you can be hired to be a digital admin assistant. Now, I know in the next segment, we're gonna have an interview that's gonna sort of lay out the digital nomad a little bit more. And then we are gonna do this week a video that talks about how we have kind of built our digital nomad business and just sort of the nitty gritty and the reality of what it is to build your own business because it's not easy and it's absolutely fulfilling and it has given us the freedom to do things on our own terms but it's come with a lot of sacrifices so please don't go into this thinking I'm going to start my business and within a few months I'm going to have enough money I need to sustain myself because that's not often the reality. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a video over at the RV Miles YouTube channel this week because we do have a lot of thoughts about that that just don't have time here on the podcast. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have our interview with Carrie DePhillips, who is sort of the queen of digital nomads, yes. to give you some great advice about working from the road. I'm so excited that she's on the show. This is just the perfect episode for her. We'll be right back. Be right back. The RV Miles podcast is supported by Hughes Autoformers, makers of the Power Watchdog Smart Surge Protector. Electrical surge protection is one of the cheapest insurance policies you can provide for your RV. And the Power Watchdog beats the competition with field replaceable surge modules. With other brands, when the surge protector takes a large surge or spike, you have to throw it away. The Power Watchdog can be brought back to life with one small affordable part you can replace yourself. It's the last surge protector you need to buy. Use the coupon code RVMILES, all one word, for 10% off your order at HughesAutoformers.com. That's code RVMILES for 10% off at HughesAutoformers.com or click the Hughes logo in the show notes for this episode at RVMILES.com slash 145. And if you want to see that in action, we'll also drop the video review. We did a great did video. A, we've we've had the Hughes uh, Power Watch dog almost a for, year now. for quite a while. Yeah, and it is fantastic. Yeah, we love that it's got a Bluetooth app. So when Abby puts too many electrical <laughs> oh, components on you. at the same time in the RV, don't put that on me. I, like I'm the only <laughs> one who does it, Mister. I forgot to turn off the air conditioner before I turn the microwave on. <laughs> we often have. It often ends up being in a 30 amp rig. You've got your air conditioner on, you've got your electric water heater on, and then you add one more thing to it and, and boom. But with the, Hughes, uh, watch, with the Hughes Power Watchdog, I can open my phone and turn it back on after I've turned something off instead of going outside yeah. to the device. I don't have to put my clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And we all know that Jason, if you listened to last week, you know that uh, Jason often... <laughs> I can't even finish the sentence. Oh, We're very Lord. happy to welcome them to the show, too. It's a fantastic product. All right. It's time for our interview with Carrie DePhillips, who is the CEO of The Content Factory, which is a digital PR agency that specializes in SEO, search engine marketing, and social media marketing. And uh, she started the company back in 2010, but she's also the co-host of the Workationing podcast, which is a really, really fun mm -hmm. podcast if you get a chance to listen to it. I sat down with Carrie a couple weeks ago to talk about being a digital nomad and working from anywhere in the world. And here's my interview with Carrie DePhillips coming to you from Amsterdam. Ooh. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so... Let's start off by talking about how you got into being a digital nomad. What, 
made you sort of decide to do that in the first place? Did you have some sort of itch that that you'd been wanting to do it for a long time or was it a, a whim thing? Uh, I had kind of strategically set up my life in such a way where I could work from anywhere, um, which I took advantage of to varying degrees for, you know, a long time. I started freelance writing in 2005. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but what I was writing was uh, SEO content. And I got into search engine optimization through the writing side of things. Uh, in 2010, I started the Content Factory, um, still going strong, uh, and I had always like been able to work from anywhere, but I found myself working from my home office all the time, just in the same corner of the house, and uh, there, there was really no reason for that. I, I started feeling like I was getting a little bit older, if not now, then when, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I have some older friends who told me that they had put off travel um, until they were retired, but now their knees have gone bad and they're not able to do all of the things physically that they wanted to do. And I started looking around at my professional situation and I, I was fully able to make the same amount of money that I was making in the US anywhere anywhere in the world. And in many cases, my, my money went further. Um, I lived like a queen in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, penthouse suite, had a rooftop pool. Everything was incredible. And we ate out for dinner every night. And it was a fraction of what I was uh, paying to live in New Hampshire wow. with a much more modest life. So it, once I started taking advantage of geographic arbitrage, and I, I'm in Amsterdam right now, so that's certainly not the only way that I travel, but I kind of got hooked. And uh, the Workationing podcast was uh, started with my best friend and colleague, Kelly Chase. And on uh, January 1st, 2017, we decided to start traveling the world as full-time digital nomads. I ran my business along the way and she continued working uh, in marketing and we started systematically not just going to places that we'd never been before, but knocking uh, items off of our bucket list while we were there and uh, kind of forcing more life into the work life balance that over the course of building my agency for the last, you know, 10 years, uh, I've been heavy on the work, not so much on the life and this kind of, was a, a way for me to hack that in. So you created your business virtually out of nothing but your experience. And now yeah, you have- I dollars that I put toward a website. <laughs> nice. And then uh, I had some SEO skill. And now uh, last I checked, TCF's website generated a little bit more than a million dollars a year worth of targeted organic traffic through SEO. Wow. Uh, last year I was named one of the top three ladies in search engine optimization, which was pretty cool. And I, I did it all without any advertising dollars. It's a really cool concept or proof of concept of what uh, SEO can do uh, if you're like scrappy and you don't have a lot of money. Like you can yeah. still do all kinds of crazy things. So now you, you've built this business up and now you have employees and they're all remote workers too, right? Yep. Yeah, I have 13 employees spread out over eight states. So as we've, as the country, the U.S. and the world is is sort of beginning to come out of this pandemic where everybody's staying at home, and I think more companies are are learning that this is this is an option um, for some of their employees. What do you th what have been the benefits for you as a business owner to have your employees working remotely, other than the fact that you can work remotely as well? Sure, um, I can speak to it from uh, I guess both perspectives. Um, from the employer's perspective, uh, I am able, I'm not limited to the talent pool that's available in my geographic area. And in fact, I'm able to source uh, better talent. And, and uh, you know, it, people in Ohio tend to, you, you can get them for a lower salary than let's say somebody in New York City, the cost of living is lower. And so you can geographic, you can play the geographic arbitrage game with employees as well. But the primary value is I'm not limited in the talent pool. Um, also, 
not just geographically speaking, uh, I have people on staff who have chronic health issues who wouldn't otherwise be able to go into a traditional office environment. Um, they do amazing work. They're fantastic at their job. They are able to do it from home, but they wouldn't be able to do it again from a cubicle. They're now brought into the workplace and like, again, doing great work. So from that perspective, uh, I, I really benefit from having a remote workforce. As a lady who used to work in advertising <laughs> and it goes through the whole, I've got a very challenging hair texture. Right, so that adds an extra 45 minutes to my routine to blow dry it all out and then uh, make up. I call it getting ready to do a job that I'm already ready to do, right? It's unpaid labor that ladies go through, uh, men don't, we won't even get into that. But uh, then you tack on the commute, then you tack, tack on the environmental costs of you know, the commute. Uh, I used to have to pay like $240 a month to park downtown, I no longer have that cost. But I tallied it all up. And on average, my employees save 500 hours per year by skipping the commute and get ready routine. Wow. And so what, what do they do or what can you do with those extra 500 hours? I know what I do. I travel, but there's like a guy on my staff is a, a legit rock star. He tours with his band. And uh, he's able to do that while also like slaying PR for me and my agency and our clients uh, because his job is remote and he's got more time to dedicate to band practice than he would if he, you know, besides his eight hour workday also had a, a round trip commute to contend with. So what are some of the challenges to working remotely and, and working within your company remotely that needed to be overcome? I've managed people in an office environment and I've also managed people remotely. What I found in managing people, uh, managing remote staff is that it really forced me to become a better manager and to make sure that I had standard operating procedures. I have workflows for everything. If I don't have one, it's a problem and one needs to be created and making sure that uh, organizationally, Everything is set in a way that basically anyone on the team can find the information that they're looking for for any client, and it's all standardized and looks the same. I don't know that I would have gotten there as fast as I did because, I, again, I was forced to <laughs> in the remote environment. Um, I think it would have taken me a lot longer to get there. Uh, in an office environment, I would have been able to get around it by going into people's offices and asking questions or um, physically handing files to somebody. In a remote environment, you need to be more organized. And if you're not naturally an organized person, it helps to have a personal assistant who, who is. <laughs> What's what's a typical day like for you? Do you have a typical day? Do you do you, are you very organized and methodical about how you plan out your work week, or or do you leave it pretty free form? It depends. Uh, usually, I try to stay with my team. Most of my team is on the East Coast in the U.S. Uh, I'm in Amsterdam right now, so that puts me plus six hours uh, on them. So it, I tend to sleep in a little later. Work. A lot later, um, I structure my day so that if I have errands to run, I'll run them between 10 and 2. My work day starts no later than 2. I usually keep going till about 10. Standard eight-hour work day, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. When I'm traveling, um, it's it dependent largely on what time zone I'm in. Again, I like to stay with my team. So, like, what sites are there to see? I'm I'm not leaving the house too much lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's an interesting time where I think a lot of people are getting a lot of work done that they weren't getting done before but also not having uh the opportunity for that all that free time that's just as equally important for all of us. But uh what are some of the suggestions that you would have for people that are interested in in sort of transitioning into a, a digital life like this? Maybe their employer is um receptive to the idea of them working remotely or they're an entrepreneur that is is looking to take their uh, 
their business with them wherever they go. What are some uh, What are some quick ideas that uh, that will help people make that transition a little bit easier? If you view it as an opportunity, and actually this kind of dovetails with a question that you asked previously about the advantages of both managing uh, a remote workforce and also like working remotely. Uh, I don't think that this gets enough play. Um, but there's a huge opportunity if you're working remotely for the first time to demonstrate to your boss that you can be just as effective, if not more so, than you were in the cubicle. And if you can demonstrate that to your managers and consistently so, then there's no reason why they won't let you continue to work from home. So that's if you can kind of get your foot in the door and then demonstrate that you will a continue to provide value, if not be more more value than you were before as a result of a lack of distractions. You're not smelling whatever anybody's cooking in the microwave. From a management perspective, and if you're running a remote company, similarly, like look for the look for the contractors, look for the employees that are consistently providing the value, going above and beyond, communicating in a way that, you know, gives everyone the warm and fuzzies instead of turns people off. That's a that's a major mistake in digital communication in general. But I think that um, as more and more people start working remotely, you're going to start to see a little uh, a little more nerves being frayed because tone of voice does not carry very well via text. And if you're trying to be sarcastic via text, like forget about it. You're just going to sound like a jerk, right? And you never meant it that way. But the way that the person perceives the message, uh, sometimes there are big gaps there, and there are often more gaps than there would be in a face-to-face or even video chat or even a a phone call where you can actually hear the person's voice, understand that that tone of voice goes away uh, via email. So all of a sudden people were in Slack chats. So all of a sudden that, that becomes a skill that maybe in an office environment, uh, hadn't previously been as cherished (laughs) as it would be in a a remote environment. Um, But again, as a manager, you want to be looking for the people who are going above and beyond, who's not missing a deadline, who's uh, like in a remote work environment, you are judged entirely by the quality, quantity, and timeliness of your work with a side of how easy are you to work with, like throughout the process as the job gets done. And so if you can nail all four of those as a remote employee, you're going to be uh, doing pretty well for yourself. As a manager, if you can keep your eye on the output and the quality of the output and the results, like the, the KPIs, what KPIs are you tracking? Are they standardized for everyone? How are you going to be able to see who your all-stars are if you're not tracking the results of their output and how much output there is? And you know, having some sort of standardized set of management metrics to consistently judge your employees by so that everyone's getting a fair shake and then you can really see who's actually doing the heavy lifting. Uh, let's shift here a little bit and talk about the, the, the practicality of living. You, so I, I travel around with my family in an RV and we have a decent amount of, of our stuff. We had a downsize. Uh, drastically, of course, but you, you're traveling uh, a lot lighter than than I am. What what do you travel with? How much stuff do you have? How what are the what are the practicalities of that? Do you have a home base? Do you keep stuff in storage somewhere? Okay, so when uh, when I first started uh, the workationing podcast and project with Kelly, both of us packed our entire lives uh, into two independent ten by ten storage sheds. Hers was in Ohio, mine was in New Hampshire, and for two years, I lived out of an international carry-on, which is smaller than an American carry-on, and I was really digging the minimalism. Like, at first, it was hard to let go of my shoe collection, but realistically, I, I wore the same pair of shoes all the time. You know, it's the converse, the comfy ones. Yeah. Um, and so I made sure to pack those, and I was fun, and I really didn't. I didn't miss the excess of stuff. I started a Dutch company so that I can stay in Amsterdam. I have an apartment here, Um, but I still travel. uh, 
I cannot fathom a situation where I would take more than my Tumi International carry on. Wow. I'm just like sold on it. <laughs> that's, a, that's absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I guess I always say too, though, if you, if you can go for a week somewhere on whatever you're taking with you, you can be there for six months on that as well. You know, yeah. it's a dog. If you, you're going to be doing laundry at the end of that week, that's it. Um, right. Let's talk about the podcast a little bit because it is, uh, it's a whole lot of fun and, <laughs> and it, it's a lot, it's a lot more than just, um, sort of tips and ideas for, for living a lifestyle like this. What, um, what do you, what do you guys, what's a, what's a general show on the workcationing podcast? Okay. So Kelly and I have been friends for coming up on 15 years. Uh, we go way back and, uh, she also has a remote job and we would occasionally, you know, like her boyfriend cheated on her one time and so we were just like, ah, let's just meet up in the Dominican Republic tomorrow. We found a good deal online. And so we would like go and do that. And then we'd hang out in the DR for a while. We uh, did a couple week jaunt out in Playa del Carmen. Um, I think that time I did taxes. <laughs> I was just like, ah, taxes, Playa, let's go. Um, and we kind of, we were sitting out uh, on the beach in Mexico having fish tacos and we're like, why, why can't it always be like this? And Kelly and I have the kind of relationship and we're like sassy enough ladies to where people tend to pull up a, a chair at our conversation. And we kind of continued that thought process throughout uh, our conversations on the podcast and our adventures on the podcast. We like to say that we are two ladies in our mid to late 27s. When we started saying that, that was a few years ago. <laughs> so now I'm going to claim 33 and I'm going to be here for a while, you know. Yeah. But we get up to all kinds of shenanigans and antics that you wouldn't expect to. I don't, I, I, Kelly doesn't like it when I call us middle-aged, you know. <laughs> but, but, but we do. So we ended up in Acapulco. That was a terrible idea, you know. Um, yeah. But uh, I guess... We do po uh, enter poker tournaments. Um, we flew a plane, caged over with sharks, just did all kinds of crazy stuff all around the world to kind of show ourselves that, that we could. And in the process, I, I guess we've inspired some other people. At least a dozen people have like recreated our workationing adventure and like found oh, wow. the people that, uh, like there's this uh, professional Tejo player. Tejo is the national sport of Columbia and it's kind of like cornhole if you're like from the Midwest you know <laughs> yeah. uh, but instead of throwing a bean bag through a hole in um, a slat you're throwing a, a little metal disc at packets of gunpowder that explode when you hit them whoa it's a fun game <laughs> wow <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so we met um we met the uh, a professional Tejo player out in Medellin, befriended him. He taught us Tejo. Um, and then like a, a ton of people have come through and met that guy and learned how to play Tejo. Because we, uh, <laughs> I wasn't that good at that game. Kelly, <laughs> Kelly fared much better. Kelly was also like a champion axe thrower though. Like she could pick you off with an axe. We did that in Montreal, uh, Canada, as you might expect. Axe throwing is a big activity out yeah. there. So we gave it a go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, let us know where we can find uh, where we can find workationing, where we can find uh, the content factory. Sure. Uh, so the workationing podcast. You can catch us on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, everywhere you catch your favorite casts. Uh, we also have a Facebook group if you're interested in finding remote work. Uh, the workationing Facebook group. I think we're up to around five thousand members now. And uh, you've got a good mix of people who are both looking to break into remote work and old school veterans who like help you through the process. The vibes are really good out there. And uh, the Content Factory is my company. My website is contentfac.com, F-A-C. And uh, all of our social media handles at Content Fact. Carrie DePhillips, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This was super enlightening. And uh, when my wife listens to this, she's going to be planning some 
European travels, I'm sure. <laughs> so thank you for getting us. Hopefully you can come and there. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be there. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. RV Miles is supported by the Highway Weather app. When it comes to RV travel, weather safety is a top priority, which is why the Highway Weather app provides weather forecasts for road trips along every point of your route, adjusted to your time of travel. You can compare forecasts, get recommendations for the best time to head out, get severe weather alerts, add rest stops to long trips, and more. Did I mention that all of that's included free in the app? For subscribers, there's a hands-free background feature to automatically alert you to upcoming bad weather. To download the app, visit highwayweather.io today or look for it in your iOS or Android app store. All right, it's time to check the levels on our tanks in our Fresh Tank Black Tank segment, where we talk about all the good, the bad, and the stinky that we're carrying with us this week. <laughs> Abby, what is the level of your black tank? Well, my black tank is actually going to be joining forces with your black tank this okay. week. So All right. we'll hold off on that because the level is high because we had our own black tank issues this week. So what, then what is your fresh tank? So my fresh tank this week goes to a really awesome bandages company called Welly, W-E-L-L-Y. We've been using their Band-Aids for a while now, and I have been beyond impressed with this company. You can find out more about them at getwelly.com. But what I love the most is, first off, the Band-Aids are incredibly durable. Let me I, let me give you an example. Yes. I, I have I, I got a, um, a bug bite on the back of my heel, and my brand new shoes, my brand new uh, sandal type shoes that go over my heel, really aggravated that and and basically made a cut there so i put a band-aid over it and we've been going down to this river that's behind us uh, almost daily almost daily that band-aid held on to the back of my yes. heel with the shoe rubbing up against it <laughs> for four days of being around here going down to the river run, walking through the rocks showering <laughs> All that sort of stuff. That and I pulled it off myself. Yeah, it became almost sort of like a game. Like, how long is this band aid mm -hmm. going? And to it stay would have on? stayed longer. It was just, it was just a, getting dirty at it that point. It was time to change yeah. it. Another reason why I'm fresh tanking Welly this week is because our kids are actually wearing bandages now. Our kids, for whatever reason, have had some real sensory issues with wearing Band-Aids. They, they didn't yes. like the way they felt. They didn't like how they would feel when you'd pull them off. And we had tried all different kinds of brands that you could buy at the store. The kids would not put a Band-Aid on. And for whatever reason, and I have many reasons why I think, but like the comfort of the welly, the, the material that is made, the fun colors that they come in, our kids absolutely zero issues now wearing a Band-Aid. It is a miracle. That alone is a fresh tank for me. But also now you're probably thinking, oh, okay, this is a really expensive Band-Aid then. Actually, it's not. Mm -hmm. One of their little repair kits, we have three different kinds. We have the human repair kits that come with some bandages and then also some ointment, and we keep those in backpacks. And then we have a kit that's a 10, and they're all in these fantastic 10s too, which is great because they don't get crushed. The tins are awesome. The bigger tin, which is just a bunch of colored bandages, we keep at home. But what is so wonderful is that you just, the Band-Aid itself, the quality is so good. And a human repair kit is $6.99. The price is fantastic. I am forever converted. They come in super cool colors. They're like hip, mo hip and modern colors. They're, they're not oh, yeah. like, there's no nude colors. Oh, it's yeah. Like <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, there's no nude. They're not trying to hide the fact that you have a Band-Aid on. And they come in different sizes, too. So I absolutely recommend these bandages. They're Welly is the name. You go to getwelly.com. You can get these. They're going to last you. You're not... It, they're just fantastic. I just just for the fact that the kids will wear a bandage. And now. this it's is this so is cool. not a sponsored thing no, or anything. We not. actually really do buy these and, and love them. Yeah, they're so good. They're so good. So that's my fresh tank this week. 
Jay, what is your black tank this week? Well, our joint black tank. Our joint. <laughs> our, our is our actual black tank. Our oh. black tank is our black tank this week. It now, finally so, got us. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it wasn't It wasn't bad. No, but, it wasn't. But this is just some advice because we ran into an issue that, that I think other people might want to know about. So normally when we, I dump the tank... Uh, I then close it, and then we add a little bit of water to it and add a couple drop-ins or one drop-in, depending on, depending depending on. on how we feel that day. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and that's it. Last time I dumped the black tank, or a couple times ago, a few days ago, when I dumped the black tank, I did not get the, the valve closed all the way. So either something was obstructing it or whatever, but it felt like it was closed, right? But something was keeping it from closing all the way. So what did that mean? Ugh. It meant all the liquid going into the black tank was continuing to drain out the hose while the solids in the black tank just Ugh. pile up. This is such a... And that is Gross how people get black tank problems mm -hmm. is in clogs, is something like that happening. Um, so luckily I caught it soon enough because the next time I looked to check the tank levels, the tank level was way too low. Yeah, it was weird. We should not have been as right. low as it was. So we knew something was off. And I figured it out um, because I ran some water and I could see it continuing to run out. You did a long flush. So what I did, yeah, so what I did, we have, we have a built-in black tank flush. We're lucky enough to have that, which is great if you don't. Uh, you can get one of those things that you, a wand that you drop into a toilet with the hose on the end of it. Um, but we have a built-in black tank flush. So I hooked that thing up and I ran that black tank flush for about a, a half hour. Yeah. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> and then I filled the tank and emptied it five times. And yeah. it's an incredible waste of water and I wish I didn't have to do all that. But on that fourth time, there was still a bunch of stuff coming out and how so do i know gross. that is because we have the clear elbow that goes into the sewer and i highly suggest if you don't have one of those get one it sounds gross to be able to look at your waist but you really need to be able to visually see that that water is running clear because what happens is when you you pull that dump valve a whole bunch of stuff comes out keeps rushing out and then keep then it comes down to a trickle and then you might wait a few seconds and then a whole <laughs> bunch more comes out and then it stops there's and then some more comes up. And when it's doing that, when it's stopping, and then some more comes up, that means there's obstructions, right? That means there's stuff that, that water's trying to get past. It might push some of it out of, way, out of the way. So that's when you need know that you need to put some water in that tank mm -hmm. and then dump it again. So I just, what I do is I close the valve on the tank and let it continue to fill through the black tank flush. Now you have to be very careful doing that because if you forget it, your black tank's gonna overflow and that water's gonna come uh. out your bathroom. So what I do is I, I set it, every time I do that, I set a timer on my phone, I let it run for maybe three minutes or so, just enough water to be able to do a flush again. And I'm telling you, if you have not ever done that, if you go do that now, you're, you're gonna get stuff coming out that you did not expect to be coming out of that tank. The water can be, the water can be crystal clear. And then you do that once and a whole bunch of not crystal clear stuff comes out. Jay, did you ever think that you would know no. this much no. about sewage no. and your family's <laughs> Would I be bowels? watching my family's sewage go down the drain every <laughs> single time? No. Did I ever think that would happen? But, uh, you know, once it's, you once you do it a couple times, you get over it. It's natural. It's fine. Yeah, it's no big everybody, deal. Everybody, what's, you know, it's like they say, everybody poops. <laughs> it's totally natural. It's just not something that you usually stand around and watch, like, leave and go into the sewer. Like, but here's just, here's my tip, though. <laughs> this is This is the tip. This is what you need to do. When you close that valve and add more water in, you need to be watching to make sure that water is not coming back out. So if you're doing the black tank flush like we have, you can, I usually as I'm flushing, I let it, I, then I close the valve. I let it to, I let it add a couple gallons and then I turn the water off because every, every time you, every time you empty the tank, you want to add some water to it. You don't want it to ever sit empty. So you, every time you empty it, you want to add a couple gallons at least of water. So I'll, I'll either let that run and then I'll watch that elbow now to make sure that the water is is not coming out or I uh, often if we're not if we're not hooked up or if I don't have the black tank flush hooked up 
I'll have Abby run the water in the bathroom. I'll have her just step on the toilet. Um, this is as close flush. as Abby gets to anything. <laughs> and that run has a to couple gallons in. So now, now when we do that, I'll have her do that while I'm standing outside, so I can watch to make sure it's not coming out. That's super important. You do not want a black tank clog. Wow, I never thought the RV Miles podcast would spend this long talking about the poop tank. But there you have it. <laughs> All right. There you have it. We are nothing <laughs> if not informative. <laughs> and let's, speaking of unusual places to have to flush a tank, what is your fresh tank this week? <laughs> oh, I get it. I was, I was kind of confused you know where you were going there with that, <laughs> but now I get it. Now you get it. So my fresh tank this week is the International Space Station, which is a strange place to poop. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, not very many people get to do it. But if, if you didn't know, you can watch the International Space Station fly overhead at night if you have a clear view of the sky. And the skies here in Arizona are fabulous. So, And we're also in a dark sky Right. It's a, this is a dark sky community. Yes. Now, there's not a ton of stars here because there's a lot of light in this campground. And we are right next to town and mm -hmm. right next to an interstate. So there is a lot of light. There's but, light pollution. Uh, but you can see the International Space Station fly overhead from from a lot of places. We've seen it at my parents' house, which is in a in a metropolitan area. But nothing like what. But nothing like here. Yeah, this was. It, this it's has a, been it's amazing. amazing, and you see it with the naked eye, and it takes about five minutes, and it comes from one horizon and heads over and, and goes down the other one, and you watch it arc over the course of five minutes. It flies very quickly. It's so wild. So if you go to NASA's website, just Google International Space Station. Uh, times and you'll you'll see and we'll put a link to it in the show note as well they have they have a list of on 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 this day what time you can see it fly by and you're going to be the, the reason it's been great over the last few nights here is it's been moonless nights so we've yes. really got to see it brightly and it looks like a shooting star and uh, so you're going to want to look at it on a moonless night and you're not going to be able to see it every night you're going to have to look at the chart and and see when it can fly by um but it, it, it goes multiple times a night, too. So I think And it's been happening for us between 8 and 9 o'clock. And so we have been coming out with our boys. It is the most adorable thing when Henry, our 6-year-old, waves to the astronauts. It's fantastic. It's just, and Ethan, has a, our 10-year-old, has a collection of stuffies that he likes to bring out his stuffed animals. He likes to bring them out because he thinks that those would be the ones that are interested in seeing the space <laughs> station. So he brings them out and it's really become sort of our end of day activity, but it is phenomenal to look at that too because the depth perception between the space station and the rest of the stars in the sky is incredibly noticeable here. Yeah. And it really puts into perspective just how far away the stars are that you look at every night when you see this sort of orangish, whitish ball floating and moving across the sky, and it feels so much closer to you. Yeah. It's just the coolest thing. It's amazing because then it comes back around like two hours later. Yeah. That's how quickly That's, they're orbiting oh, around the Earth. It's so awesome. It's incredible. I mean, they're doing it right now. Yeah. We and just you can't, can't see using a telescope is useless because it's moving mm -hmm. too fast. You can get binoculars out and, and get a closer peek at it. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. We'll put a link to uh, finding the details out in the show notes, but that's something great to do while you're sheltering in place or while you're out in, in the middle of nowhere Absolutely. visiting uh, some beautiful dark sky communities. Okay, I think it's time to wrap this episode up with a brain teaser. How about? How about it? While his parents are away, a teenage boy and his friends drank some of the parents' gin. Ooh, this is racy. Did you ever do that when you were a kid? No comment. <laughs> I remember when I was I remember when I was make maybe Jack's <laughs> age, actually probably older. Oh, Jason. I I tr I, wa I tried to drink a beer. I tried to force I tried to force myself to drink it. I could not. I I took like two sips and then I just poured the thing down the rest of the drink. So then I had to go through all the stuff of like hiding the fact that I drank a beer, but I didn't even drink it because it was so gross. Got what you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> While his parents are away, a teenage boy and his friends drink some of his parents' gin. This, of course, is strictly forbidden. 
They then poured water into the gin bottle to return it to the level where it had originally been and put the bottle back exactly where they had found it. So dumb. However, when the couple came home, the father took one look at the bottle of gin and turned angrily to his son to denounce him for illicit drinking. How had he known? I don't even need to look at the answer. I already know because it's exactly how we would know <laughs> if our kids had done exactly. it. Exactly. Yes. So we'll have the answer to that and a whole lot more on next week's episode of the RV Miles podcast. Yes, we will. And hey, if you are enjoying the RV Miles podcast, we would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcast and please leave a five-star review. Your review helps put us in front of new listeners every single day. So thank you. Thank you very much to those who have already done it. Also, we want to remind you that RV Miles is all across social media. You can find us at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter every once in a while, and of course, YouTube. We have the RV Miles Facebook group. If you haven't joined it, what are you waiting for? It's a great group of people. We are thick into the full-time RVing series, and we have a whole section over at rvmiles.com. And right here on YouTube, if you're watching us, just look for the playlist. Until next week, we will see you. Be well, and remember, keep logging those RV miles. Bye, everybody. Bye.